Good morning and welcome to this morning's webinar. This session is brought to you by Andrew Bannister, a director at Earl Kendrick, and he will be discussing planning and managing major works. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get through as many as possible at the end. Uh, the session is also being recorded and will be available to watch back via the News on the Block YouTube channel later today. Um, I will now hand you over to Andrew so that he can begin the session. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Vicky. Thank you for the intro there. Um, good morning, all. Um, as Vicky said, I'm Andrew Bannister. I'm a director at, at Earl Henry Film Surveys running the North the Midlands office. Um, firstly, my apologies for anyone who was booked on the session last week. Uh, I did have COVID, have 99% recovered, still have a very slight cough. So apologies if I do cough a little bit during the session. Um, I will try and mute if I go into a coughing fit, but so far it's, uh, it's all been okay. Um, so what we're discussing today is, uh, is planning for major works, the processes that you sort of need to think about, go through. Um, and, and this is all basically derived from our experience of planning for major work. So there isn't sort of technical documentation out there that we've taken this information from. This is just our experience to date. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll be of use to yourselves. So for, oh, let me just get my slides working. Seem to have, there we go, they're back on now. Okay, so for anyone who, who doesn't know uh, or hasn't heard of Earl Kendrick, just a couple of brief slides on who we are, what we do. Chartered building surveyors, offices around the country, London, Manchester, Brighton, Birmingham, Bristol. So. Um, pretty much wherever your portfolio is, we can assist you with it. A few niche arms within the business, um, the, the license to alter team, reinstatement cost assessments, or your building, building insurance valuations at the party wall side we've had for a while. Uh, the EK Digital, who do the drones and thermal surveys. Um, I think they've been with us for 12 months now. And within the past few weeks, we have added uh, Kendrick Rope access to our repertoire. Uh, we can come and do ab sales surveys for you and also potentially a little bit of maintenance during those surveys as well if we feel it would be necessary and, and, and help. So um, overall, hopefully we, we will certainly have a service that will be of assistance to you in the future, if not currently. So chart build survey is what we do. Um, like I say, we are do typical chart building surveys in terms of we cover all those general elements of major works and defect analysis and everything. Um, like I said, the rope access and the drone and thermal surveys are, are relatively new. Um, we do a, a lot on, on cladding work, on cladding consultancy, um, looking at external wall, doing external wall surveys. We do fire surveys for you, compartmentation, looking at fire doors, and also implementing the remediation works and managing them. Um, we do a lot of insurance reinstatements. We're members of the Chartered Institute of Loss Adjusters. So we do a lot with um, with works, working with property managers in, in fire and flood reinstatements after those uh, disasters. So moving on to the agenda for today, for what we're going to cover. Um, hopefully my session is about 45 minutes from now. Um, so that'll take us up to about 10 to 11, and then there'll be a bit of time for some questions and everything from yourselves. Uh, like I say, as Becky said, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and I will uh, look to try and get through all of them if, uh, if any are, are submitted at the end of the session. So, a um, few things we're going to cover. Uh, what to check for in a lease. Fine tuning your, your project and the timelines is very important and managing the, the funds. Scoping out the works, actually, what is required, um, what can be done within the budgets, managing your stakeholders. Uh, opening up the good communication channels, communication vitally important in any major works project, understanding your own role as a property manager and how you can assist the surveyors, issuing your section 20 notices, um, looking at um, teamwork and more particular the contractor there rather than the builder surveyor, um, a few slides on health and safety and CDM, and um, a little bit on, on the day-to-day -day running of a successful major works project, but uh, I, I might overrun slightly, uh, and there might only be some very brief slides on that. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, looking, moving on to what to check for within the lease. A couple of bullet points here, so I'll just go through each one. Um, clarification for each property is due for silical major works. So what does it state within the lease? Does it give a specific time? Uh, as an example, does it say 
every seven years for painting or is a little bit more specific in that it says every four years for internals and every five years for externally painted surfaces. It's important to know uh, exactly what that says uh, within your lease for, for each and every property. And it's important to stick to those timelines as well. Um, our sort of ethos, what we say is the best way of planning for major works is implementing having a, a planned maintenance program done or a, a PPM or a CapEx plan, you, you might know that as long-term maintenance plan. Because within that document, we will have reviewed your lease and say, stated when each next silica works is stated within the lease. Um, so it says every seven years during a 10 year maintenance pro program, there may be one or two cycles of uh, major works required. Um, if every five years, there may be two or three, so on and so forth. So the, the PMP is, is a vital document in planning for your major works. Um, you don't have one for each property. We, we do recommend that one is put in place and would appreciate it. It can be hard sometimes to get them in place and um, with the costs sometimes involved with them. But, <clears throat> but it is, like I say, it is important to check when those works are due and to stick to those timelines. Um, obviously for a number of reasons, but the main one being, if you stick to those timelines, there is less likely to be deterioration happen to surfaces of the building, less likely of damp issues, water ingress, and, and so on and so forth. What if there is no stated time within lease and it's quite vague, uh, silent on, on this element? Um, what to do then? What if it just says when the landlord specifies or when a management company sees fit? Well, your surveyor will guide you here uh, in terms of when would be the best time to, to implement works. Um, and that will be looking at the condition of the building now and the budgets available and so on and so forth. And again, that's why we say the plan maintenance programme is a really, really vital document because if it is silent or there are timelines in there, your surveyor will give you guidance on it. But just as some general and, and typical guidance in terms of when elements do need painting, generally for external timber, um, there is a requirement for every five years, but this can, this can vary massively depending on location. You know, are you, are you on a seafront? Are you on a busy main road? There's gonna be you know, quicker, more deterioration. Um, but also what's the quality of the workmanship when the timber was installed? Is it a softwood? Is it a hardwood timber? When was the last redecoration project done? And how, uh, what was the quality of that redecoration project? So all of these elements can make a big difference. So uh, a, a, a simple, and I say the inverted commas there, apologies, you can't see my camera, um, Zoom doesn't detect it, unfortunately. But um, so a, a simple, external redecoration project can turn into a, a bit of an ugly one, a bit of a laborious one, if a detailed specification, you know, it's not provided to contractors and all these other elements of timelines and everything are not checked within the lease and within the, the planned maintenance program. So the, the second bullet point there is understanding your client's obligations. What are they obligated to do? Whose responsibilities lies where? Who's going to pay for what? Um, I used an example of timber windows here because it's a, a very typical one where um, the responsibility for the external redecorate the external painted services might be the, the landlord, the management company, whoever, um, but the actual repair of the windows and your repairs could be the leaseholder responsibility. So if, for instance, the works have not been done as per the timelines in lease or have been um, you know, the, the, the company's been negligent for a number of years in not doing the works and there are extensive repairs to the timber windows, then, it, you know, it is that battle of the leaseholder saying, well, I don't, I don't think there would have been as many repairs if you'd have done the, the repainting every five years as the lease states or so on and so forth. So again, another reason why it's important to stick to those timelines uh, where possible and to implement the PMP, the Plan Maintenance Programme. Now, granted, those timelines do, do sometimes fall away for reasons of maybe the works aren't actually needed, the budgets aren't in, in place, but that's where the PMP will, when used as a live document and updated regularly, will help and give everyone um, you know, the knowledge and the understanding of when the works are going to be implemented so everyone is, is fully aware and it's all clearly communicated to them. The next bullet point is uh, knowing when you can request the, 
leaseholders' financial contributions to the works. So again, what does it state in the lease? Is it something that you can only, <coughs> excuse me, is it something you can only request on a yearly basis? Uh, if so, then is that going to have a, an implication when the tenders come through? Um, let's say you've assumed the project would be an eighty thousand pound one, and the tenders come through, and it's a hundred thousand pounds. But unfortunately, you can't collect the next bit of money for another ten months. And um, so, so what happens then? Does the project have to go on hold? Does it have to be phased? Um, you know, there's those implications that need to be considered. And again, I, I revert back to the plan maintenance program. That's why that's a vitally important document because it will have looked at that. The survey will have looked at those lease covenants and included it within the PMP. So that document should tell you exactly, you know, what you should be um, requesting as a budget and would hopefully be, um, you know, within the reasons of uh, when the tenders come through. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the last bullet point there is. Um, does the lease actually allow the works? So for most leases, it's repair and maintenance. You can't upgrade, you can't do, do certain things. Um, an example I'll use here of a project currently involved in where uh, it's on a seafront, um, it's had a lot of deterioration to the masonry, the render and the bricks. And we went to inspect uh, the scope and document, scope and document I'll talk on in a, in a few slides time for repair and maintenance. And um, we submitted the, the documents to the clients, had a meeting with them, four directors in the RMC, two were in agreement with what we said, and the other two said, no, 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 we want to do a full scale re-render of all areas because you know, we, we want this render to last you know, 20 years. We don't want to be doing works going, going forward. Um, well, firstly, just because you've re-rendered all the areas doesn't mean that you don't have to do any other works for another 20 years, there might still be issues around windows and, and so on and so forth and, and what have you. Um, and plus as well, actually there's, you know, re-rendering that whole block where it was currently brick with bits of render. And um, does that, you know, is that an upgrade? Um, so does, is the lease actually going to allow it? And where you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 leaseholders, wherever it may be, um, for, for a project of that scale, it only takes two or three just to say, nah, I don't want to pay for that. I just want to stick to a repair and maintenance that the project comes to a, to a standstill. So understanding what the lease is actually going to allow for, what it states in terms of the, uh, the maintenance that is required. <clears throat> so um, moving on to section here in terms of allowing yourself enough time. You can see a um, picture from the left, my colleague, holding a, a one of our major works wheels. Um, so we put this together, again, based on our experience and obviously from a, from a legal point of view, is what needs to be done from the moment you instruct a surveyor to the moment that you, you get on site uh, and a timeline, everything in between. Um, you can see, possibly just about see there's different colours on that major works wheel. You could spin it around to your date and it'll you know tell you all the timelines and everything for, for things that need to be done. They, they are um, sort of general, obviously for some projects, things can be speeded up, but other projects it will take longer. But the general timeline um, from instruction to surveyors getting on site, we estimate is normally about six months. Um, see a, chat, uh, a question has just come through in the chat box. I will respond to those at the end. Um, so yeah, so about six months. So we always say the best time, if you need to get something on site for the, for the summertime, then the best time to do that is to start impl implementing the works in October, November, the year before. Get the survey instructed, get the scope and documents done, get the, the specification, everything ready, and you will be there to go on site at the, at the start of summer and have a whole summer time, hopefully a good summer, to get the work done. So like I say, they are, they are generic. Uh, some things can be speeded up. Some things, some things do take longer. If anyone would like um, one of these Major Works wheels, um, just drop me an email at any time and, uh, with your address and everything, and I'll get them sent out to you. Um, I'll put my email in the uh, <coughs> excuse me in the Q and A in the chat box Q and A box um, at the end of the session. So, um, so we've talked about the lease. We've talked about the timelines. 
And now we're looking at the, the actual budgets, which we touched on a little bit, obviously, around the lease. Um, and again, uh, a few bullet points here that I'll go through. So analyzing your, your client's reserve fund, what do they currently have in place to get these works implemented? I'll revert back to using PMPs, plan maintenance programs, as the perfect tool for managing major works, for planning for major works, because that's the thing that's going to say your budget. You've had it, you know, a surveyor technically look at the building, what needs to be done, and um, that's going to help you in terms of, of setting the fund up and, and obviously checking what's in there. Now, plan maintenance programs, obviously, they're not they're not tendered costs from contractors. But, so they are they are budget costs. They are there to give you a starting point to start collecting the funds, um, and actually they're 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 currently getting harder and harder to budget for um, to place costs within the plan maintenance program, given the uh, the rate at which materials are increasing at the moment. So um, they should be checked regularly. We use a number of ways of putting them together. Um, RIC costs from the RICS, costs from SPONS, which is run by the RIBA. And, and obviously, you know, similarly tendered projects as well, which is the better option to, to choose because it is going to be more accurate. But yeah, they're, they're the tool that's going to help you set the what needs to be collected. And then you should check in your reserve fund to see whether that matches the planned maintenance program or it's there or thereabouts. Um, and again, liaise with the surveyor. Once you're instructing a surveyor, you know, dear Mr. Surveyor, we've got this uh, roof we want to be replaced. Uh, we've got a currently got a sum of about hundred thousand pounds collected. Um, is that going to be enough? Now, remember, in that sum, you've got to cover your VAT and you've got to cover the professional fees. So, hundred thousand pounds might be enough to actually do the works, but can you cover the additional uh, charges that are unfortunately in place in you know, VAT and, and, and the professional fees as well? So, be, always be open and honest, communication-wise, with the surveyor, with the leaseholders, with everyone involved. Um, you know, here's the money we've got currently. Do you think it's enough? Do you think we're going to have to do this project next year? Can we look at phasing it? Um, yeah, so the other bullet points there we've just covered. Obviously, is there a capital expenditure, expenditure plan, <coughs> um, which essentially is, is a bit more detailed or slightly different from the plan maintenance programme, um, and communicating the funding situation clearly and concisely. Make sure the leaseholders know as well. You know, the RMCs, whoever you work with there in, in each block, Make sure they're aware of it because um, I think sometimes, you know, that well, quite a lot of the time actually they're, they're not, or they're aware of what they may have in, in place, but they're not actually aware of how much the works are going to cost. So it's important they are made aware of it. If there's going to be, uh, obviously we can collect them, there's going to be some additional um, invoices submitted for to ensure the works can go ahead in whatever year it may be. So I've mentioned um, a few times on the scoping documents, so I'm just going to kind of explain a little bit more as to what that is. Um, we see it as a, um, a document that kind of takes the PMP into the specification stage. So a PMP will look at a whole building, we'll look at everything there, and I've got a few sort of pictures here. And um, you see the building in the top left, huge, massive building. The PMP would look at every sort of elements on there and give give advice um, as to what works need to be done when, looking at the lease, but actually looking at what the issues are as well. The lease might say, you know, do external works every seven years, but you could have failing elements that need to be done, you know, now. Um, so the PMP will put in a kind of a triage scale, if you like, of what needs to be done, you know, desirables, repair and maintenance, health and safety. And the scoping documents would then take that PMP, if there's one in place, take that on and be more specific in terms of what needs to be done. So I, I pulled out the middle photo here was one of these towers where, um, where the PMP and the drone surveys we had done pulled up the fact that um, there was a load of issues around here. So scope and document was able to take that forward and, uh, and implement that into a more, into a specification to be more specific. Within our scope and documents, we provide uh, budget costs, but we also provide lots of photos as well, lots of photographs. They're very, really, very really useful because um, if you've got large buildings, even on small buildings, the person who's in the ground floor flat might not be experienced in the water ingress, um, you know, like the top floor flat is, and they might be saying, well, why do we need to do these works? Why do I need to pay £3,000, £2,000, whatever it might be? Uh, and our scope and document with the photographs 
and um, we can all, you know we also take videos as well and we can send the videos on shows exactly why that needs to be done we do think it helps people get on board with the project if they were previously being a bit uh, uh if they were against it because they didn't really quite understand it um again if you've got a building of the size of the one on the left i think it's 200 odd flats in, in that one um you know th there's no chance that the flat down at the north end of the block uh you know knows what's going on the south end of the block and vice versa um, unless they obviously communicate internally so we work in uh in the scope and documents we provide budget costs against everything i've mentioned <coughs> excuse me and we set out all elements so roof works um elevations windows drain down pipes rainwater goods etc etc and provide evidence as to why each and every item needs to be done and um, so you've just got a, a photograph here you can see above the drone taking of this tower section uh, and you can see liquid repairs done to the, the joints of the coping stones. There's obviously been previous water ingress there and some quite a bit of vegetation in the gutters as well. Uh, so the drone survey is really useful, plan maintenance is really useful. That's helped put together the, um, the scope of documents and the specification. So um, understanding who your, your stakeholders are. Apologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, it's important to understand who all the stakeholders are within the project and everyone else knows who they are as well. So we would put together any project we're instructed on, we put together a project directory with everyone's details on there, um, all the invoicing details or things like that. Uh, so everyone is fully aware. And it's important that they all do know. So you know, if, if you've got you know an RMC or <laughs> whoever it might be that you're dealing with with the clients. You know, it's important they meet with the surveyor, whether by video or face to face meeting, or phone calls, whatever it is, to ensure that they can build up a good working relationship and they're able to, you know, to speak to each other if issues do happen. In most cases, nobody knows more about building than, you know, the client, the people who live there. Um, so it's really, really useful to get their, their knowledge of the building. Uh, obviously, you've got RMCs, RTMs. So, yeah, important to, to differentiate between the two. Uh, it's important that the contractor understands the difference between the two and the surveyor involved. Uh, you could have, a, could have head lease holders, freeholders. Um, obviously, you've got surveyor, contractor, and, and yourselves, property managers. There, obviously, that's just a, a, a kind of a, a bit more of a general one. There could be more involved. There could be ME engineers, structural engineers, solicitors, um, all kinds of different consultants involved in there. And they all become stakeholders of that project so it's important that everyone knows who each other who they are um for a number of reasons that if if the you know if the structural engineer needs to get in touch with um with the surveyor uh, they don't need to go through the property manager to do it um likewise if they need to speak to the contractor they've got the contact details there they know exactly who they are they can pick up the phone and request any information that they do need So what is your role? <clears throat> what is your role as property managers? Uh, you, you have a very, very important role, very vital role within the project. Um, and probably the first one is that communication conduit for all for all stakeholders. Um, now it's you'll you will find that as I mentioned before, the structural engineer might need to get in touch with the contractor, and it's obviously far better if they do that direct, but maybe keep you copied in aware of what the conversations have been so you can you will understand what's going on and you can pass all that information on to the leaseholders and, and your clients um, we when we're instructed on any major works project we will do site progress reports they might be weekly they might be fortnightly depending on what's being agreed um, but we keep them clear as, as possible we don't try to put too much technical jargon in there but sometimes there's no other way of explaining it other than in a technical um uh, technical mindset technical wording but it's important that you understand what we put in there so if at any time you, you don't on any project whether it be also be another surveyor involved or whether it be another another type of specialism get i'm giving them a call and say i don't quite understand what you're talking about here could you just further explain this for me because ultimately you need to know what's going on because you'll be passing that information on to the leaseholders to the clients and if they you're in a meeting with them and they ask a question obviously it's, it's far better if you can give that answer straight away rather than saying oh, i'll have to go back to the surveyor i'll have to go back to the contractor and get that explained further so your vital vital role in communication 
because um, without good communication, projects will um, ultimately fail in, in one, one way or another, um, either by people getting uh, frustrated with other people, um, information not getting passed on, contractors not getting their, um, their certificates on time, their instructions to move forward with it. And but, you know, also uh, one of the things we always find is um, you know, leaseholders haven't moved anything from their balconies, their, um, their, you know, the pots, the plants, the chairs, all their furniture, and then the contractor uh, either has to move it and the leaseholder gets annoyed or some damage has happened. So just ensuring that that good communication is, is passed around to all. <clears throat> so liaising with the neighbours and third parties. Yeah, so um, if you've got, you know, I'd say, especially for anyone who, who's on the, the session here that lives in London, obviously you've got a lot of people that are right next to you in your buildings. Um, not very often you get one that's fairly, uh, fairly detached and you can walk all the way around it. So ensure that your neighbours know what's happening, send them the programme, give them the updates as well. Um, let them know if the, the potentially is the scaffold going to ever sale their property let them know you think that's going to happen early on. The contractor and surveyor can help with sailing licenses uh, and going through neighbouring land act if necessary. But if you have that good communication with your neighbours, more often than not, they're more willing to work with you because ultimately they'll probably have to be doing the same at some point in the future. So they will want the same and uh, the same service back. We had um, an issue with a project where um, two sides are very accessible and two sides not so where um, the rear elevation um, butted up to a car park for a neighbouring building and on the right hand side of the property and we found out that the leaseholder actually purchased that land at some point in the past and um, we weren't aware of this as you know as we started the project and as we assumed that the, the property manager had you know got all the necessary uh, access requests but unfortunately they hadn't um, and actually the leaseholder who, who owned this bit of land was refusing to give access. So we've had to go through, I uh, guess, solicitors involved. There's a court hearing coming up with it, but ultimately it's delayed the project massively due to COVID as well. It's had an impact on it, but um, the first phase was done pre-COVID and we're now almost going to be three years on before we can get to do the final section. So it's important to, um, to be aware of, of who owns what land and any licenses and agreements that need to be in place to access said land. Um, preparing an issue in the section 20s, <coughs> obviously is a um, responsibility of the property manager. There might, you may you get assistance from the surveyor in terms of what needs to go in, what the works are, uh, certainly for your notice of intention, and then obviously what the cost were for your statements of estimates. You may also need a solicitor involved. Um, I think the you know, majority of, of managing agents, property managers, them themselves but there might be some that are a bit more complex to work a bit more complex or there's some issues within the building that um, might feel it might be that you need to get a solicitor involved in them <clears throat> so the finances and the administration another vitally important role basically ensuring everyone is getting paid on time so when the major works go on site you will likely enter into a contract a jct contract joint contracts tribunal with the contractor and the clients, you know, the RMC or whoever it may be, you may sign it on behalf of the clients if you've got permission. But within that contract, and obviously it's a legal document, it states the timelines of when the contractor should be paid. So upon their first day on site, let's say the 1st of March, four weeks later, they can submit their valuation to the surveyor. The surveyor then has um, seven days to or five days to get on site and um, okay, that valuation or, or negotiate, whatever it may be, there's less work to be, that's been done. Uh, and then that gets submitted via a payment certificate from the surveyor to yourselves and the contractor will submit their, their invoice. You've then got a set amount of days, five days to get that paid. Uh, if that isn't paid within that timeline, you are essentially putting your client in, in breach of contract. Um, and the contractor, if they so wanted to, would be in their right to charge late payment fees. Um, and this happened on a regular basis, you know, every every month or whatever, six weeks when they're submitting the, the when the valuation comes over, the payment comes over, the contractor might decide to suspend works. Um, certainly on big projects when there's you know, big money involved, um, it'll it'll frustrate them. So it's important they're paid on time. A couple of additional things. It's also important the surveyor is paid on time. I'll start. Um, but a couple of things to to make you aware of there. 
how, you know, has the contractor been set up on your system? Do you have a, a process that they need to go in order to get paid? If so, that needs to be done before they get on site because otherwise it just causes so many issues. Also, how many payment rooms do you have a month? Do you only have one? I know some managing agents do. If so, um, if the contractor misses that, that payment run, they're not going to get paid for another four weeks. That's going to cause issues for them. So if that is the case, then the contract start date needs to work backwards from your payment run to um, so that the contractor will be paid on time and within line of the contract. So make sure that the surveyor involved is aware of what your payment run is. And also, do you, do you issue work orders? Does every invoice need a work order, um, you know, purchase order number with it? If so, then make sure the surveyor and the contractor knows and that they are given that works order, uh, you know, in, in plenty of time for them to submit their, um, their valuation. If you need the cost, and, you know, the actual figures before you do that, again, let them know because they will ensure that there is a speedier process for when they do the valuation to get on site. If everyone knows of the potential issues, they don't become issues and we can make sure there's, there's plans in place to, uh, to, to work around them to, to bridge them. <clears throat> and so the, the, the final element there is supporting the surveyor. Um, the, surve the surveyor supports you, you support the surveyor, you both support the contractor, the contractor will support you both. Um, if, if everyone works in that collaborative way, supporting each other, the 99 out of 100 projects will run with, without any issues. It's when there is that drop in communication, um, that support goes from one different party is where issues start to build up. So if everyone plays that supporting role, projects will more often than not run along smoothly. Imagine the uh, expectations, this is a further thing on being a good communicator. Everyone has different expectations. Um, I'll use that example I used earlier on at the building where on a, on a coastal front where four directors to repair and maintenance to want to do. Uh, render repairs, full full um, re-rendering. We weren't advised of, of they wanted to do or can even consider full re-rendering when we were initially instructed, and, and you know we went and did our scoping document for repair and maintenance. Um, when we went and had the meeting with them, you know, two of the directors said, uh, "Well, this is what we wanted." Um, so you know we weren't aware of it, uh, and at that meeting we had to say to them, "Well, okay, we can give you costs for that." Um, however, there are a number of things that you need to consider beforehand. And realistically, you know, you're, you, have you actually got the budget to do the repair and maintenance? Because before you put the new render on, you're still going to have to do some repairs. So if you haven't even got the budget for repair and maintenance, there's no way you've got the budget to do a full re-render. So managing those expectations initially from that outset is vitally important, making sure people, all the stakeholders involved, know exactly what's happening. Uh, we have it a num number of times, you know, and, and it's no, it's not necessarily, you know, the, the anyone's fault. It's just the fact that some people don't realise what um, what works are actually, be, 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 you, know, you know, being implemented. Um, Matt times, timber windows, people say, I need a window replacing, it's failed. And you go out and you have a look at it and the paint has failed essentially, the paint is flaking off and they're expecting a window to be replaced. You know, these, some people have, know literally nothing about construction and property and issues like that. So they're just assuming that that's what needed to be done. Um, and then when you tell them, well, no, we're only gonna paint the window, they sometimes, you know, they sometimes get a bit shocked. Surely you can't just paint that window, it needs to be replaced. And it's actually, no, it's just the paint that needs to be done. So making sure everyone is, is fully aware of it, um, and also managing the expectation when it's on site, the amount of times, certainly with scaffolding, um, that people will uh, be aware of it. We've sent all the notices out, and then they still go, well, there's scaffolding outside my window, I want it removed. Um, you know, unfortunately, we need to scaffold the project in order to get the works done. Uh, I think this is even more of an issue now, and, and I think certainly going to be this summertime, with more people working from home, um, and obviously we're, we're, we're sort of more coming out of COVID now. <coughs> he says coughing. Um, we are coming out of COVID more now and there are going to be more projects of site. Things that have been delayed for the past two years will be brought forward. And, and you know, so there's going to be, um, there's going to be noise on site. There's going to be um, dust, you know, 
banging, sawing, drilling, all these type of things. And then during the summertime, if you're at home and you want your window open, uh, it's going to be an annoyance. Certainly if you're maybe got to present on a, on a you know, Zoom calls and everything people have now. So it's important people are aware of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and can there be anything done to assist them? If somebody you know, has a very, very important meeting or maybe a job interview or something like that, then you know, plans can be put in place to ensure that there are no noisy works for them during you know, that, that time. Uh, that can obviously be difficult when you've got 150 leaseholders or having these different meetings at different times. So there does have to be that management of expectations. Uh, as I mentioned a few times, good communication is about sharing updates, keeping sure everyone's in, involved in a project and aware of it then uh, no one can come back later on and say, you never told me about this. Uh, one of the particular ones here is um, when a scaffolding is due to come down. Uh, we always send an update, you know, a letter to say the scaffolding is due to come down in the next two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it might be. And uh, we want to know if you've experienced any issues, if you've got any, any type of, of uh, <clears throat> snagging defect from the works. Uh, unfortunately, that does open a bit of can of worms where people will come and say, yes, I've got this, that and the other. But it's important we we are aware of it and we will go out and we will have a look and we will make the decision as to whether that actually is part of the works or whether that has been there for you know the time beforehand and actually is not relevant to the works. Uh, but if we're not aware of it uh, and it was relevant to the works, obviously if they're up on the fourth floor or fifth floor, whatever it may be, uh, access to fix anything externally will be an issue. Um, and if we're not aware of it, they don't, you know, if they don't make us aware of it, then um, there can be some, uh, you know, issues, heated discussions with how we're going to get back up there to do it. If somebody is away, again, it's important that we know that whatever flat uh, is away for, for the time and aren't back, and then to see whether we can get access, just to check ourselves to see whether there are any issues that have happened from, from the works. Um, because sometimes it, it does, you know, with, um, we did a project uh, pre-COVID now, replacing lintels above windows, you know, 500 odd windows where it was. And every now and again, there was when you replace the lintel, there was a, a bit punching through the plasterboard. So we had to go in and do repairs. Um, so things like that, it's important we're aware of. <coughs> um, Be Good Neighbours, already touched on that. Um, you know, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, important you, you speak with your neighbours, uh, anywhere around you, let them know the works are, are being planned. And, if anyone is, is refusing to give access, then you may need to go through the neighbouring land act in order to, uh, to get it solicitors involved and, and possibly court cases, unfortunately. So on the section 20 process, um, I'm sure everyone on the call is, is more expert than me on this. So um, I, I won't sort of dwell on this too long, but um, a couple of points, obviously draft them up with care and attention. Uh, if you're, you, you notice of intention, don't just put um, external repair and redecoration. Be more specific. There's going to be brick renewal, render repairs, repointing, timber repairs, redecoration, replacing of rainwater goods because it failed. So really go into that detail on it. Um, and then there is there is less issues that can uh, crop up later on. Again, it's same with the um, statements of estimates. Um, we our tender report or, or, you know, is detailed and should be enough to supplement it. We do elemental analysis of each and every um, element, you know, bricks, timber repairs, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone's fully aware of what's required, where and when and how much it's going to cost. Uh, do you need to get a solicitor involved? I suppose that's really only a question that you could probably answer yourselves. Um, and if there, if there is need, then obviously, yeah, get one involved as early as possible. Uh, building a contingency buffer to protect yourself. So any project will have a contingency in it. Um, so let's say a £100,000 project, you might have a 5% contingency, but it may be worthwhile to also have a further contingency that you um, keep aside, keep separate um, for further unforeseen elements. Um, any project we recommend is 10% contingency. So on a £100,000 project, it should really be £10,000. But like I say, you might want to have 5,000 contingency that goes in the contract and you might just want to have a further 5,000 um, that you keep as an additional contingency should it be required. Uh, as I mentioned before, yeah, break down the entire cost of the major work project to make sure it's transparent and easy for everyone to read. 
So just a brief slide on some of the key stages for planning for major works. Uh, involve your building survey as early as possible. Um, minimum six months, more if possible, earlier the start. They can start on it, uh, the better. Is there a PMP in place? If there is, that, that might be, you know, before involving the, the building surveyors early, might already be there. If not, you can still get one done. It can coincide with doing the specification scoping document. No reason why not. Um, we do them actually for, for a lot of buildings where maybe they've not done works as often as they should. We will go on site, uh, you know, do the specification, implement the major works for and monitor all on site. And at the same time, when the work's done and the scaffolding's up, we will also put together a PMP for them um, so they can use for the next 10 years. That's actually a really good time to do it because you can look at everything in detail, whereas otherwise you're looking at it from ground floor, maybe from flat windows, and you don't get as, as much information as, as you require. Scoping documents. Yeah, spoke on that. It's the go-between between the PMP and the specification of works. That gets sent out to contractors. And then you've got your, your tendering, your tender reporting. So they're the key stages for planning for major works. So we're looking to, to choose a contractor. Here's sort of things that we will look at. Uh, and it's vitally important that these, these four points are checked. Their financial strength. Are they you know, financially strong enough to actually do the works? Um, certainly on larger projects, there might be a case of where they have to buy materials. Um, if, you know, when the project starts, they don't actually get paid till about six weeks in. So it might be that they've got to pay their subcontractors, you know, their scaffolders and, and what have you. So after they've got the strength to be able to pay them until they wait to get the payment from, you know, from yourselves, from the clients. Uh, so checking that is important. Management structure. Yeah, again, large projects. You know, it's OK having the guys on site to do the works, but have they got a site foreman? who can act as that liaison to any leaseholders during the daytime when there's any you know, immediate issues that need to be rectified? Have they got a contracts manager? And have they got the, the staff back of house, you know, back in the office to issue uh, you know, all the payment certificates uh, and things like that and to liaise with? If it's just one guy trying to be the contracts manager, also doing the admin in the office and being a site foreman, he's probably not going to have just one project on either, they might have four or five on, uh, and therefore you're going to find that they're responding sort of late. So larger projects needs bigger management structure, obviously smaller ones, you can have uh, less so. So it's important to see which contractors are suitable for which job. Health and safety competence. Yeah, um, are they going to be CDM compliant? Um, have a look at maybe some current sites that they're on, see what it's like, is it tidy? What's their construction phase plan like? Have they got all their required health and safety documentation? Again, larger contractors will, will have these. Um, some, of them, some of them still need it updating, but you know, they'll have them in place where it's smaller ones. They do struggle to, to get the documentation over. Um, so it's vitally important because you don't want a contractor on site who's going to have health and safety issues. The health, health, and, safety, health and safety executive turns up on site and there are issues with the contractor your clients could also be liable. So it is vital that that is checked. Obviously your surveyor will, will check that and be thorough and, and rigorous you know, going through it, but it's important anyone to get put through the section 20 process that the same procedure is followed for them as well. And the obvious, yeah, obvious why, you know, evidence from previous similar projects, have they got somebody who will give them a, a bit of a gold star rating? Have you been on any of their previous sites uh, to have a look at the works? Uh, we are coming towards the end of the, uh, the session now. I appreciate I'm on, I'm on the sort of 45 minutes, so um, a couple more slides to go through, and then I'll have a look at the questions. So tender analysis, really, really, really important. Um, the report that the surveyor does and the actual analysis, let's say you've, you've gone out to tender four contractors, three of them are £100,000, one's at £50,000. 99.999 times out of 100, the £50,000 one is not accurate. So the tender analysis and tender reporting will weed that out and we would not put forward somebody we didn't think could do the works competently for the money that they are suggesting. And we would state that within the tender report and then we would say, you know, go with the next, the next contractor, contractor B. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, you don't want to go with, with somebody who's so much cheaper than the others because they won't be able to do a good enough job. There'll be issues on site and um, more often than not, 
you know, you're going to have to fix them afterwards once they've gone. Um, it just creates more headaches, more issues for everyone involved. So the tender report is a really, really, really vital document, um, uh, you know, to go through all of the other tenders received and make sure they are compliant, competent, and no one's missed out any sections. The CDM, um, Health and Safety, and missed <coughs> a couple of times. Um, so when does it apply? CDM applies to every single project, uh, even smaller stuff. Sometimes it, we do a whole new, uh, we've got a whole CBD session on CDM. If anyone would actually like that session, drop me an email again and we can come and deliver it to you, to you and your company. Um, but yeah, it applies to every single job. It could sometimes be something as simple as a, an electrician on a set of ladders, putting in a new light, CDM complies. Um, so you do need to get their risk assessment and method statements to ensure they're gonna do it safely. Um, principal designers, obviously we normally get appointed a principal designer when we're in, uh, involved in a major work project um, and we would take that risk, uh, alleviate some of the risk from the client that should an issue happen on site, um, you know, they would be liable, but ultimately they still have roles and responsibilities under the CDM. We would just do vigorous checks to make sure that the contractor has said he's going to do everything right in his construction phase plan. We would also attend sites to check that his site is clean, it's efficient, and actually everything is in place that needs to be. Um, obviously, you know, from, from our point of view, we, we can't be there, you know, nine to five, five days a week. Um, so there is a reliance on the contract to do it. But like I say, they do have res responsibilities under CDM as well. So as long as a client has put everything in place, whether it be by a principal designer or whether it be by themselves, then they're not going to be held responsible for any issues that happen on site. It will be down to the contractor. If there are things that have been missed, then the client could be liable. And obviously, you, you, you don't want things like that. Um, that's just an accident waiting to happen. So uh, by following the correct CDM procedures, it'll stop anything like that happening. Should stop anything like that happening. So last few slides now that I will um, I'll go through a bit quickly. It is more, more about once the project is up. Um, so the net, once the scaffolding is up, the next, the most important next meeting, next site visit, straight after the scaffolding is up, the survey, really, really important because um, we look at the whole work so we can get a look at it in detail. Is the contingency going to be enough? Um, what the provisional sums are allowed in? You know, all the provisional quantities that have been allowed, are they going to be sufficient to cover the project? So that first inspection, really, really important from, from everyone's point of view. Um, <clears throat> once the project is on site, our official role as a surveyor is called contract administrator. Um, and there is a, a guidance note produced by the RICS in terms of what a contract administrator's role is. Uh, I think it's about 250 pages long, if anyone is, uh, has enough time on their hands to read through that. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, any works will likely go through a JCT contract, probably the more ones that you recognise here are the two in the middle, minor works and intermediates. Um, anyone who's involved, possibly like a cladding remediation project at the moment, might uh, be aware of the design and build JCT contract, but... Um, yeah, the two ones for generally more major, more, more standard major work projects, all minor works and intermediates. Um, this was a section on uh, the payments, which I, I'll skip through because we've already touched on that. Um, so the last one here is just a, a bit of a, a recap on the, uh, on the major works. So understand the stakeholders, check the lease, review the PMP, Always clear and concise in, in your finance, in your finances, finances even. Um, set out the communication and data from day one and select your build and survey diligently. Read the scope of works and understand everyone is aware of what's happening. Um, have a meeting, ideally face to face, because I do think personally video calls do seem to kind of can go off piece a little bit. Uh, face to face meetings, I think most of the time can uh, stay on track and draft the section 20 notices very, very carefully. Make sure everyone's aware of their, their roles. Um, work with your clients and the surveyors to ensure the ideal contractor is selected, not necessarily the cheapest. 
communication, regulate communication pops up a few times because it is vital for any major planning for any major works project and implementing it. Um, and pay the surveyors fees and the contractors fees uh, on time, um, typically within 14 days. That's, they, that's from the day they submit their valuation. Um, so the timeline is actually, I think it's 10 working days, which essentially is still normally still your, your 14 days. Understand your role as managing agents, um, you know, maybe set that out from the start with the surveyor in terms of what you're going to do, maybe what you're not going to do and what is relied upon of them, um, making sure that they've captured all that within their fee proposal. Um, and let everyone know what's happening. Again, back to uh, back to communication. So um, that is the, the end of the session. Um, let me have a look at some of these, uh, these questions now. So... Um, there's another question. There's a question that came up. What about installing communal EV charging points? Can the leaseholders do this or would they need to vary their lease first as it's an improvement? Uh, excellent question. And I think that is one that is still possibly being battled out um, in the courts. I think ultimately it, it's a case of if everyone is on board with it, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the any freeholder is as well, then you can get it done. But yes, obviously it would be useful to have a solicitor put in whatever variation to the lease it needs to be, maybe in a license to alter, um, just to ensure that all the legal points of view have been crossed and ticked. And then going forward, any maintenance regime for them is also um, set out as to who's gonna do what. Um, but yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine, I've not actually done a project yet myself where uh, EVs are being uh, implemented. Uh, I think some of my colleagues in London have, but yeah, I imagine if you, you know you've got twenty leaseholders and only two want to do it, uh, it's going to be quite hard to implement. So, but I think as this progresses on, certainly with the way the cars are going, they're all going to be electric at some point in the future. That there, you know, there will be an allowance to do that, and it will be it will have to be implemented. Um, like I say, as soon as people switch over to electric cars their mindset will, will have to change. Hopefully that answers the question for you. I know it's a bit uh, vague uh, in some areas. I don't have a definitive answer there, but um, yeah, like I say, uh, I, I, what I will do actually is I'll speak to some of my colleagues in London to see what they've done in those, those projects there. Um, but there'll definitely be ways that they can be implemented. A uh, couple of the questions we've had are, what are the consequences of not adhering to lease obligations with regards to frequency of decorations, i.e. landlord wants to do it, but some lessees refusing to pay as they don't feel needs doing? Um, well, well the, the, old, the, the, the kind of the worst case scenario there is, in, is they're in breach of their lease. The landlord is wanting to do it and leaseholders are refusing for whatever reason, um, then they will have breached their lease. But if they don't feel it needs doing, then that's when you do really need the surveyor to come in. Because sometimes, yeah, that, that does happen. The lease might stay every five years, but there might, be, there might be no works needed to it. Or there might just be one elevation that is, um, you know, suffering from a little bit more, um, something with a little bit more deterioration. Just had a note saying, Vicky would like me to answer that question live. Sorry, Vicky, has there been an issue with them? Um... Sorry, no, that I was just clearing the question because you've answered that one. That's what it was. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Apologies, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, Sorry. That's all right. And then the final question is, how are you finding becoming involved six months in advance in this pricing market? I've I've had Section 20 statements of estimates served and instructed work within six months, but the price has changed by the time gathered funds and ready for work to be instructed. Yeah. Um, yeah, really good point to raise, actually, really good question. So at the moment, certainly on larger projects where there are materials such as insulation involved, so that's um, you know, roof replacement and obviously you know, cladding remediation works, that contractors are stating that they will only stick to their prices for maybe 30 or 45 days. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't help with your statements of estimates and, and getting the project on site and potentially getting the, the money uh, the budget put together. But what we'll do is um, we will work with the most suited contractor, whether that be the, the lowest or you know the lowest tenderer or whoever, and we will say, right, 
you're going to you're going to get the works um but we need to go through this process we've got a legal process to go through we've got to collect a little bit more money for a reason so we don't think we can get on site for another six months but what we do need from you now is what that cost is going to be in six months time so work with the contractor work with the surveyor and there might have to be some increase done initially to allow for the cover of the costs in six months time now the other side obviously the the, the flip side of that is that they can allow uh, a budget you know a bit of an uplift in them inflation at the moment is 6.2 percent so you'd have to kind of see what what the current inflation rate is at the time and see what is reasonable now inflation could unfortunately rapidly jump up insulation costs could unfortunately rapidly jump up as well but most manufacturers most suppliers know when those price increases are coming over the next six months it's harder to project over 12 months 24 months but most of them will know for instance i know that there was an increase in insulation that happened at the beginning of march um so so i, I any projects that i had I, I was aware of it and we implemented it for the going on site in the summertime um so that, that's the best way you can deal with it. Get this contractor on board that you're willing to go with, get a surveyor and, and work to put it in place. Like I say, most manufacturers, most suppliers know when the price increases are coming. Um, just to add on to that as well, actually, that in June, there is an update coming of the building regulations. One in particular that will be important to you all is um, Part L, which deals with thermal efficiency, conservation of fuel and power. Um, the U values for the roof, a U value is um, the thermal efficiency of roof, how it's measured. They're dropping, they're going to be lowered. Um, so any projects that happen after that might need to have thicker, bigger, better insulation on them. So that is also something to just be mindful of that, that's going to be coming in place in, in June. Um, you can, if you are starting works this summer, as long as you submit your building regulations notice before June the 15th, then you don't have to adhere to the new regulations you can stick to what the current one is and hopefully what has already been priced so hopefully that answered the question for you there um i will um i will drop my contact number in the chat box now um if anyone has um <clears throat> excuse me if anyone has I don't know whether that should come through to everyone. Let me just send, send that again. If anyone has any issues with, a, with any project, you want to give me a call after this session at any point um, for a bit of advice, please feel free to do so. Uh, my email address is just coming through on the chat now. If you would like a major works wheel, um, drop me an email, give me an address, uh, and I'll get some sent out to you. Or again, if you've got any projects you just need a bit of advice on, drop me an email and I'll give you a call back. Um, thank you all very much. That pretty much takes me up to the, the hour. Uh, so thanks for thanks for listening. Um, thanks for rejoining again a week later. And uh, yeah, that, thank you. Hopefully I answered all the questions for you. Thanks, Andrew. That was great. Um, I'm, if you want to send me a copy of the slides, I'm also happy to send them out to everyone who's registered for the webinar. Um, with your contact details if anyone wants to get in touch with you directly. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the session's been recorded, so I'll be able to send out the recording as well later today to everyone so they can watch it back if they want to. Um, yeah, other than that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, wishing you a speedy recovery. I hope you're feeling better soon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you to everyone else for joining us today. Um, if you would like to join us for any of our other upcoming webinars um, throughout April, then please visit the News on the Block website where you will be able to register. Um, otherwise, everyone, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining us. Bye, Andrew. Cheers. Thanks, Mickey. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. all. Bye-bye.